working well tonight, and there's absolutely nothing that God cannot do. Do you believe that tonight? Amen. Uh, I'm glad that with him, uh, the Bible lets us know that uh, nothing is impossible uh, with God. And I just want to praise him uh, that he knows where we are and thank him for his blessings. And I thought you was coming for to sing, brother. You coming? Amen. All right. <clears throat> It is uh, so good tonight uh, to know the Lord and uh, to know that we have the opportunity uh, that other people can know the Lord. Uh, and that's what I want to talk to you about a little bit tonight as we, uh, I know it's been, uh, been a little while uh, since we have uh, done what we're going to do tonight. Uh, and that is to uh, talk about uh, uh, some outreach of, of what uh, the outreach part of what we've been doing for almost two years uh, since October of 2015, one time a month. Uh, we have been doing the uh, 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 what, what is called 24 to double, which is actually Christ's model for the church, uh, teaching us as a church uh, what, to, how we're supposed to be doing what we do, how, how is the, the most effective way to do ministry, what is the most effective way to reach people, to bring them in uh, so they can hear the gospel. And uh, I just want to praise God for what He's been doing. Amen? How many of you glad what God's been doing? Amen. So what we've been praying for, we've been trusting uh, God to do, and uh, in just a minute they'll have uh, uh, they'll have this up uh, so that we can uh, uh, we can step into it. Uh, but I want to I want to give you just a little uh, a little bit of some things that uh, have happened over these last uh, uh, last almost two years uh, that we have been doing this. Uh, just give you a little example. Uh, one example is Bible school. Do y'all love Bible school? Uh, when we began this in 2015, uh, which was uh, in October, uh, we began talking about it, talking about what, how God can use that, the different little uh, parts that we can have in it the, uh, of being a church that reaches people and a church uh, that reaches into people's lives, inviting them. In, in uh, June of 2016 was our first Bible school as we had started this process. We're in nowhere even close to being finished. We are just now on the part of structuring it, but there's a couple things we have been doing from this uh, to do that. So that very first night uh, of Bible school on that Sunday night, we had 50 more people on that Monday night than we had had in the year before. So you got to think about that for just a minute. Uh, uh, let me just go ahead and like, like bring this down or bring it up, however you want me to do it. Uh, we are not about numbers. We're about people. And so numbers are how you keep up with people, reaching people, and what is going on. So that very first year that we were doing this, uh, we structured things a little different in Bible school. We had 50 more people on that first night than we had had in the, in the year before. And, and so I want to say hallelujah. Amen. This, this year, which is our second year, which, uh, which is the second time we had done this and structuring it that way and working toward it, there were 100 more people. So you see that what is going on. And the same thing is happening in Sunday school. God is uh, blessed in Sunday school. We, we don't have any classes at this point, uh, places where we can put people. We're trying to find some more classrooms, all that. Uh, and uh, God, is, God is using that because what God did with that is gave us a tool as Christians, as a church, to say, hey, use these tools. It's simple. Use what you have and let God, let God lead you. And so tonight I want to give you a tool for your personal life. Uh, that can uh, help you, and we're going to do it uh, in maybe a, a little different way uh, than we've been doing this. We, we do this, in case you haven't been here, on a, uh, uh, we usually do it on the second Sunday night, not every time, uh, on the second Sunday night of, of every month. Uh, we talk about uh, Christ's model for the church, what it really means, what the church is here for, what it's about, uh, and how to use wh who God has made us uh, to reach those who don't know the Lord, uh, to reach those in our community who are unchurched. Uh, to we, I want want to be real honest. We do not want to be a dying church. Amen. We want to be a church that is alive, that follows Jesus and reaches people, that people can know that he is alive and well. And uh, I just want to praise God for what he's doing. So I want you to join me, uh, if you will. First of all, let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, just ask the Lord to uh, speak to our heart. Father, thank you for who you are. God, thank you for what you're doing in our lives, God, right now, Lord. God, thank you for what you're doing 
for us and through us as a church. And God, I pray that we would just hear your voice. God, that we would allow you to use us right where we are. God, we know, Lord, we are living in a time of turmoil. We know we're living in a time, God, when people's lives are turned upside down. But Lord, I want to thank you that you're here to turn them, uh, turn them right side up, God. Lord, I pray that you would use us as that vessel. Use us as that beacon in the darkness, Lord. God, use us as a church, God, to shine. Uh, Lord, is a light on a runway that they're about to crash, but God, they can see in that darkness and find that landing place in the peace of God. Father, you know what you want to do. And Lord, I pray that as a church, that we would be obedient to you. God, we would be available to you. And we would allow you, God, uh, Lord, to mold us, allow you to shape us, allow you, God, to, uh, to move us where we need to be so that we can be that vessel that you can use for the glory of God. Father, thank you for all your blessings in our life. God, we want to praise you, God, for what we have seen you do over these last uh, few months. God, working in people's lives and drawing uh, people to the place, Lord, of trying to, to find healing and strength that they need, God, right in this time. Lord, thank you for what you're doing in our lives right now tonight. And God, I pray that we would be obedient to you in everything we do. And we just want to give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. It's good to know the Lord. Amen. I want to ask you something tonight. Some of you that have uh, been here and been uh, through some of this, how many, how, what percentage of people said they would come to church if they were invited? 80%. 80% of the people say that if I would be invited to church by somebody, that I would go. Wow. How many of us don't invite people because we're afraid they won't come? Raise your hand and you can be real honest. All right, I told you this morning, it's the safe zone, all right? One thing that's not safe in here is your billfold if you did not tithe. Amen. Wow, that just didn't go anywhere, did it? We know better. There you go, sister. When you think about in life, if 80% of people said they would come, why are we who have the answer, who have who Jesus is in our life, not inviting them? Why do we not step over that line? Sometimes it's because we don't, we don't feel like we're equipped to do that. We don't feel like we have the tools to do that. Other times we have too many things going on in our life to do that. Sometimes and most of the time it's because we do not have the burden that we need to do that. We don't see the need of inviting those because uh, we realize, we think, hey, we got another day, we got another hour, we got another month, what, we'll invite them next month, we'll invite them to this. And so when you think about that, let's go back to the Scripture and see what Jesus says. And it's found in Luke chapter 14. Turn that with me, if you will. Luke chapter 14, right quick. And uh, we're going to read this verse, and then we're going to kind of go through a couple things and go uh, right over into, into another Scripture that's found in Luke. But I want you to look in Luke chapter number 14. We're going to read one verse verse, and then we're going to go from that one verse and kind of walk through uh, some things in our life. Luke chapter 14, and uh, we're going to look in verse number 23. It's kind of at the end of the story. Uh, the, the, here's the whole thing. that They have made a supper, and they invited all these people to the supper, and when they invited them, they came back with excuses. One had bought a cow or an oxen and said, hey, I can't come. I've got to go prove this thing. One had bought land. They said, hey, I can't come. I've got to go see it. And one married a wife and said, I can't come because I married a wife, and everybody understood. So you watch as all what the whole thing was this. They didn't come. The supper was prepared. Everything was ready. Everything was going like it should go. But they did not bring. Uh, they, they did not come. So what did that uh, that master of the house? What did he do? He said he tells his servants. He said, "I want you to go." He said, "I want you to find people." He said, "I don't care who they are, where they are. I want you to go." And that's whenever you come. This verse of scripture is found in verse number uh, verse number twenty three. And the Lord said unto the servant, "Go into the highways and hedges and compel them uh, to come in, that my house may be what." And my house may be filled. Why did he want them there? Why did he want them there? Somebody. He wanted them there to eat. He wanted to feed them. He had something for them. And I want to tell you now what church should be about. It should be to the place that in our lives we know uh, that those who are not uh, in church, that don't have a relationship with Jesus, that we invite them to the house of God because there is something for them there. They can get something for, them, for their lives at the house of God. Can, can we have an amen right there? Amen. 
And so we understand that the whole principle of inviting, the whole principle of compelling is so that they can know and they can hear and they can uh, receive for themselves the same thing that we have at a salvation, that is strength, uh, that is to know that the Holy Spirit lives in you, that is a conviction, that is everything uh, that God has for their life. They can find it uh, be, by getting connected to God at the house of God. I know people get saved everywhere. I know some, I, you can get saved in a stump, you can get saved in the woods, you can get saved going down the road. You can get saved anywhere. Can I have an amen right there? Jesus said it's for whosoever and wherever they are. If they'll trust Him, they'll be saved. But I want to tell you something. They are not going to get saved until they hear the Word because the Bible says faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So we've got to get them to somewhere so they can hear the Word of God. Amen? That's the place He said, I want you to go out. I want you to compel them to come in. Now when I think about this sort of word compel, I've always thought about it in a way of beg somebody. Like, hey, you need to come. This is, you, you've got to have this. You need to come uh, to get... Y'all know what I mean? This is also... That is, that is a little bit of what the Word is about. Though the Word itself is about enticing them. It is giving them something to come for. Not just trying to get them here. Not just a scare tactic. It is saying, hey, this is what is going on. Something that is going on in their life. You say, I know some people that's having, having a problem in their, uh, in, in their marriage. Hey, you know what you need to do? You're to sign them up for the marriage conference. Y'all know what I mean? You, you say, I know somebody that's getting ready to get married. Give them a wedding gift for $30. Sign them up for September 29th. It'll make them or break them. Amen? So when you think about a need that somebody has... And you see, some, that is what the church is supposed to be for. We are here to help people where they are and to bring them to the place of where they need to be in the design that God created for them. And so when you think about that, I'm not going to spend time going over all of these things. I'm trying to get to, to, to something that's, that we can all do personally. But here, here's kind of where we are. We're at a place in this process of two years uh, of doing team building. And that word team, don't let that scare you. We've used it all these years at Poovey's Chapel. We have, we have a lot of committees. It's kind of the same thing. As the word team is, it just means that you're coming together as a team. And when you do that, it's a team of outreach and what we call consider big events. Somebody tell me a big event that we have had. Easter. What's another one? Christmas. What's another one? Revival. Okay. We, we, we know big events. We have those things that we invite people to. We usually have four a year. One is Christmas. It's already happening. We ask everybody to fill out seven names of people that we can send a card from the church with your name on it so it invites them to be here on that Sunday to celebrate Christmas with you. Right? No brain. It's awesome. They're, going, they're, they're already big days. They're already kind of thinking about it. Whether they, whether they let you know it or not, they're thinking about, hey, something's going on Christmas, Easter, those things. We do, uh, we do a couple more a year. This, this year it's going to be the very first Sunday in October, which I think is October the 1st. Is that right? Somebody look at a calendar real fast. I know you don't got your phone in your hand anyway. No, you don't. Praise the Lord. October 1st, we're going to have a big event Sunday, that Sunday. So now what we need to do is think about seven people. I need seven people that I can write their name down or I can send them a card so that we can, I can personally have them an invitation sent to invite them here on that Sunday because I need them to hear the Word of God. I need them to know who Jesus is. We're going to do a big friend and family day that day on October the 1st. So that is big events. But we're talking about, when we think about what we are doing right now, here's, here's what an outreach team, it is to Seek ways to help reach people by bringing them to God's house. Is that place of understanding God's house is where it's at. Amen? I do believe in church, do y'all? I believe it's God's way, it's God's will, it's God's desire, it's God's design. God designed the church to, to work uh, in this world so that people can come and realize that, hey, I can get healing there. If you remember, we go in the book of Acts for just a minute. They would always take that lame man sitting beside the gate at the temple. Why did they do that? They, do that, they did that because they, uh, they knew that there would be compassionate people that are there that will help them with alms. But I want to tell you what, they did that because they were hoping that somewhere he'd get some help. Amen? 
And so the church is the place where help can, can come to people's lives, where salvation can come to people's lives. So a, an outreach team is for this. It is to, to plan events so that we have a tool as a, a, as a church to invite people to, whether it's a, whether it's a big event Sunday like we do Easter, Easter uh, whether it's Christmas, uh, whether it's what we're going to do with Friends and Family Day in October, those type things. It is to plan that so that we can say, hey, I want you to come with me. The church on Sunday. We did. We we've done this uh, for the last last couple of years. And as we read just a few minutes ago, Luke 14 and verse number 23, that part of compelling is that part of of making it to the place where people want it. How many of have ever seen an advertisement? Would you raise your hand? Wow. How many of you have ever watched an advertisement or seen a poster or seen a picture of something and it made you want it? Would you raise your hand? Wow, that's exactly right. I did this the other day. I cannot remember where I was. I, I didn't want it. I, didn't even, I wasn't even thinking about it. But I looked over from where I was. I, I, I don't even remember where I was, but I remember the sign. There was a big old sign probably about like this and about this wide of an ice cream cone with the ice cream starting to run down the side. I didn't even want ice cream until I looked at that sign. Y'all know what I mean? Anybody with me on that? The church should make the mouth of sinners water for what's on the inside. It shouldn't be a place where people say, wow, I'm not going there, it's dead, I'll get judged. It should be a place where people should say, wow, I want what they have. And so the outreach team is about building those, uh, those events or whatever that is going on to the point of, hey, this is what is going on so that we have that tool. You and I have that tool of inviting people in. So I, I just want to let you know, we're looking for people uh, to, to be on this team. It takes five people to start this team. And, and we're looking for those five people. So this week, uh, we have a group of people that are going to pray. We're, we're going to try to, and some of them going to pray and fast this week. So guess what? The Lord might have your number for this outreach team. So if you'll just go ahead and volunteer tonight. I've got two amens out of that. Praise the Lord. Now we're going to pray because I want to tell you it's the most important thing you have as a church. Just a few minutes ago I asked someone, what is, what does it look like? What is outreach to you in a church? What does it mean for the church? What does outreach mean? Somebody said it means life because without it we are dead and stagnant i have pastors and evangelist friends that preach all over the all over everywhere and one thing they say is we're going into places where there's nothing where people will praise they'll praise the lord where people will say amen maybe but there's no life they're not doing anything outside of those walls of the church there's no burden to reach other people. And a, 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 an outreach team is there to cast that vision because here's what Jesus called us. And, and it, was on, it was on one of these slides back here just a second ago. It was on uh, this one right here, that we are becoming fishers of men. What did Jesus tell the first, the first disciples we see Him uh, reaching out to? What did He tell them? I've come to make you what? Fishers of men. You're good fishermen. You do what you do great. But that's not what I'm here. I'm come. And you can be become a fisher of men. Now, I want to tell you something about those disciples. They had no uh, training whatsoever. They were not. They didn't go through Jesus' uh, soul-saving uh, class 101. He said, I want to let you know, I'm here to make you a fisher of men. That you and I will be in that place as a disciple. That our heart is to reach people. Because people need Jesus. And without Jesus, people go and die lost and they go to hell. He said, I'll put you here to be fishers of men. Church, I want to tell you something today. It's not about anything else but fishing for people. It's about fishing for them so that they can know Jesus. And through knowing Jesus, then they can be discipled. They can grow. And then they can fish for, they can fish for other men. They can fish for those who are lost in their life. Because all of us have a network of people. All of us have a network of friends around us or acquaintances around us. How that we are, are responsible to reach into their life and share who Jesus is in our life. 
to them so they can know, hey, this is the Savior of the world. Someone you think about, and this is, I know this is uh, something from uh, maybe uh, more in the corporate world, uh, but this, this also applies to what church does. If an industry is going to be in any way successful, they're going to have to advertise. Because almost everybody, everybody in here, raise your hand that you saw an advertisement somewhere. Right? Doing it again. Y'all seeing it again. Praise the Lord. Y'all got something playing up here I don't see? We got, you seen an advertisement, right? Made you think about or want what is going on. The same thing is, is, is in a church when you do events, when you do outreach. It is that, it is that same thing. Some do 10%. If they, are, if they are a company that really wants to reach people, they usually do 20% of their annual budget in doing that. What about churches? What do we do as a church to set forth that here's our goal? That this is what we're going for, and that is to reach our friends, our family, our community for Christ. It starts in our heart, and then in, from our heart, it begins to work that we are, we're the compellers. We are the ones who go out and compel those others to come to know Christ. Uh, as I said just a minute ago, it, it, we're, we're going to kind of go through this real quick. Uh, uh, a church of 100 people, it takes 25 to 30 people to do outreach team. Think about that for just a minute. So if you have a, a, a church of 200 people, you double that. 300 people, triple that. Y'all get the idea, right? So what that does, go all the way back with me to October of 2015. Does anybody here even remember that? But it's a place where we understood what the principle of reaching people is about. And it came from the model of Billy Graham doing all of his crusades. They ask him a question, how many people do you know how to prepare for at a crusade? How do you know how big of a stadium to get? He said, it's real simple. How many people do we have volunteering? Because how many people volunteer? He said, you're going to have four times that many people. Because when people are involved, they are going to at least invite about seven people, and four of those are going to come. So you think about that as a church role. So if you have 25 people that are involved, when you are involved in something, you're excited about it. If you're mad about it or upset about it, you don't need to be involved in it. Amen? It's pretty simple. It's not your gift. Crank out of that thing. Amen? When you think about what is going on in life, when you're excited, you want to tell other people. Is that right? I mean, Y'all know what I mean, don't you? Y'all ever shared something before? I mean, man, uh, you watch people, they find something on sale. Man, they won't tell everybody so they can all get one. Y'all know what I mean? I, some people tell me, I've never done it before, but they'll, they'll, they'll have these things that come up where they have like a one-day sale on something. And they're like, man, we can buy something for $50. It'll be $10. Man, they'll start sharing, hey, I'm going to let you know about this. Y'all know what I mean? Why don't we do that with Jesus? That part of compelling, that part of getting it out, that part of understanding where people are. And so this is just a breakdown of, uh, of what teams really look like. You have a team leader that is an administrator. Uh, you also have a, a, a trainer, somebody that helps just lets people know, hey, this is how you do what you need to do. Uh, that is in, uh, this is in every single team that we do uh, as a church, a prayer leader. Uh, that, is, that is somebody who has that prophetic gift. They are there to keep it spiritual, to keep uh, that connection with God and, and, and with the people. And also an encourager, somebody that's a, that's a cheerleader. How many of you know you always need encouragers? Amen. Then there's, uh, because I, I want to tell you, sometimes when you are doing what you're supposed to be doing, you can get discouraged. Y'all know that, right? Satan will come from every direction. Here's what he said in the book of Galatians. He said, don't be weary and well-doing. He said, I want to tell you something. There's sometimes you are doing the right thing. You are in the right groove. You are walking in your gift. You are doing what God has given you to do. But sometimes you can get discouraged in that. Sometimes you can have doubt in that. You need that encourager to say, hey, I know it's hard. Keep on going because don't grow weary and well-doing. He said, for in due season you shall reap if you what? Faint not. Keep going. So you need that encourager. And then you have that recruiter, somebody that is there to help out recruit people. I'm, I'm not going to go through what all these mean. I just want to kind of give you that overview. You say, well, preacher, what does that mean for me? Where can I start right now in my life today in this in, in outreach? Well, I want to tell you, the absolute number one place and the only place that we can begin and the only place that will ever work in our life in outreach is prayer. 
You can have every single thing that you know. You can have every kind of program that there is uh, in your life. You can have all these things uh, that can fit together. And you say, wow, that looks great. But if there's no spiritual power and the Holy Ghost is not doing it through your life, it ain't going to happen. Amen? Now, it is the same way as a church. We can have programs. We can have everything down to a T of everything that needs to be done. But if we do not are not following the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit leading us as a church, we have nothing but a building and we have nothing but a social club. Amen? It takes the power and the presence of God to get us through where we need to be. So now I want you to take your Bibles. I want you to turn in the book of Luke. I'm just kind of going through all these so that I can get to the end. Aren't y'all glad I'm not going over all them? Can I have an amen right there? Uh, we, we went over a lot of them. But I, I want you to look in with me in Luke chapter number 10 real quick. Luke chapter number 10. And I was, I, this is the whole uh, of outreach of where we are, of things that you and I, where are we going to be involved in this? What is our part in reaching people? When I think about reaching into people's lives, what, what is my part? Where, where do I fit into all that? Because the Bible lets us know that, that we are, we're, in a, we're, in a, we're, we're in a whole world. Matter of fact, he said in, in, the book of, uh, in the book of Matthew, chapter number 28, he tells us, hey, you're, you're, you're supposed to be going out. You're supposed to be making disciples. You go into all the world. He says over in the book of Acts, chapter number 1, verse number 8, he said, I'll let you know something. I've empowered you. I have given you power so that you can be that witness. Uh, right where you are in Judea, you can be that witness in Samaria and then unto the uttermost part of the world. How in the world can we reach our world? Amen? We, you and I have our own world. We have our own people right around us that we're supposed to be part of, at, that are a part of that plan. In our Sunday school class, we're studying a, a, a little thing called Three Circles. And it talks about in the book of Acts how that in two years, and you've got to think about this, in two years, in the book of Acts, they reached eight, around eight million people. You've got to remember, they had not invented the telephone by then. I know this is a shocker to some of y'all. We used to have a telephone that hung on the wall. My granny's telephone, you could pick it up and listen to the neighborhood conversations. And that was pretty fun because you always want to be real quiet. Y'all know what I mean? Did anybody in, in here, did anybody else ever do that before? If you did, would you read, oh, praise Jesus, we're in good company, amen. You would go. You'd, pick it, you'd hear somebody talking. It wasn't that you just shut it down real quick. You had to listen. Y'all know what I mean? I had to just really make sure somebody was on the line. No, no phones invented. As far as I know, they did not have Snapchat. They didn't have social media. They didn't have the Internet at that time in that way. They just told people. They have exactly what we have today. They told people. And so when you think about that, who, who am I supposed to be telling? Who am I responsible for in my personal life? And let's take this outreach thing from a team as a church down to a, where am I, me personally. And so when you listen to Jesus as he tells them here in Luke chapter number 10, from verse number 29 down to verse number 37, does anybody know what this story is about? If you do, just tell me. The Good Samaritan. I heard somebody say, The Good Samaritan. And when you think about this story of the Good Samaritan, uh, this whole story came because Jesus wanted to know and they wanted to know who their neighbors are. If I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself, Jesus, who, who is my neighbor? Jesus said, oh, well, let's let me tell you who your neighbor is. Listen to the story. And it's found here in Luke chapter number 10. And uh, beginning in verse uh, number, number 29. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Neighbor. I want to ask you something today. Who is your neighbor? Everybody. How many of those everybody's are we reaching? We just said it. We said, hey, everybody's my neighbor. How many of them are we affecting with the gospel of Christ? How many of them do we really see as our neighbor? Because Jesus said, if you, you're supposed to love your neighbor as what? as yourself. He said you do that because the first commandment is that you love God with everything you have. You love Him with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. He said, and then the second commandment, which is the great uh, commandment, He said, I want to let you know you are to love your neighbor as yourself. Do you love yourself enough to get saved and go to heaven? Do you? 
you know you don't want to personally go to hell. But do I love my neighbor as much as myself if I don't tell them? Wow, who is my neighbor? When you look in Luke chapter number 10, you understand who your neighbor is. I'm not going to go through the whole entire story, but I do want to give it to you in an overview. The Bible says, as there, there's a man who is headed down to Jericho. I've been on the Jericho Road before. It is scary in a bus, I'm going to tell you that. But on the Jericho Road, when they would go, that was a place the thieves, they would hide out and, and they would try to trap people. They would steal what they had. And that's exactly what happens to this man. So Jesus tells them a story that they understand, they know about. He said, first of all, whenever this happens, in Luke chapter number 10, he said, there's, there's a certain priest who come by. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. He says, oh, look at that guy. He's in bad shape. The Bible says he saw him, and he just got way away from him and passed by the other side. Now, I know that would not... You can understand this priest was not a Baptist, right? Because none of us would ever do that. What do y'all think? So he passes by on the other side. He saw him. He understood that he had a need. He understood that he was in bad shape. He understood that, wow, this guy needs some help. The Bible says he just passed by on the other side. Now, can I ask you a question? Did that priest love God? Yes or no? Wow. Let's go back to what Jesus said. Jesus said, the first commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. And if you love God with all your heart, you're going to love your neighbor as yourself. So guess what? There's something missing in this priest's life. So if my life is not lining up with the Word, number one, I've got to get where I need to be with the Word so I can love my neighbor as God told me to love my neighbor. So sometimes it is not because I don't like their ways. I've got a problem with me and God. And my vision ain't where it needs to be. Whoo, we just got a little deeper on the Jericho Road than we probably should have, didn't we? You think about this. Okay, the, the next one says, he passes by. The Bible says, then there comes a, a Levite. And by the way, this priest had the answer. He should have had everything this guy needed. He should have been able to help him. He could have been able to bring him to the place he needed to go. Can I just let you know something? The church has the answers. They're searching for answers all in the world. We are that priest. We have the answer. We have what they need. We're able to bring them every single thing that they need in the world. I want to tell you today, the brokenness that is in this world today can be fixed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if they never hear it, they'll never understand they can be fixed. Amen? So this man who is near death, laying in the ditch, is passed up by the priest. The Bible says then there was a, a Levite who comes by, this religious uh, man who is, who is coming by. And it, uh, uh, when I get this picture, when I see this man, the Bible says this Levite, he said, when he was come at the place, he came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. So you've got to get this picture. This man who is, who is here on the Jericho Road, there's a big canyon on the Jericho Road. You, you're going to fall into it. There's a, a little small passage uh, that is here. And, and, and this, this, this Levite comes over and he, he looks on him like, Dude, you got some problems. Why in the world don't you get up, clean yourself up, fix, up, fix yourself, and get on the right road? Can I tell y'all why he can't? Because he can't. He's broken. When you look at people who are living in sin and you wonder why in the world don't you fix your life, can I just let y'all know something? They can't. The power of sin has a hold on them. The Bible says sin has a dominion over them. And so he just looks at him and said, Dude, man, I can't believe you're like that. And the Bible said then he gets over on the other side and he goes on. Did this man love God? Just leave out. Here's what Jesus said. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. What is the commandment? The commandment is, I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. Wow. You're looking at who's my neighbor. Then the Bible says there's a Samaritan. When he said the word Samaritan, in the scenario he is, in the setting that he is, they automatically got mad. The Jews did not want to hear about the Samaritans. 
There's a lot of different reasons why. But they did not want to hear Samaritan. They were a mixed breed people that the Jew looked upon. They looked down upon. They saw, they saw them as dogs. And you hear that in some of the language that Jesus uses as he talks about uh, some different stories in the Word of God. Uh, they, they didn't want to go through Samaria. They didn't have anything to do with Samaritans. And Jesus said, but there was this Samaritan. They're going, there's no way it's a Samaritan. How can a Samaritan love God? How can a Samaritan ever have anything to do that is good? Nothing. They cannot do good. They are ungodly. They're, they're, hey, are y'all hot out there? I see a bunch of y'all fanning. Are y'all just fans? Are y'all fans? When you think about this Samaritan, the Bible said he comes over and he, he gets down to where the man is. He begins to dress his wounds. And the Bible said he picks him up. And he puts him on his, on his own donkey and says, Hey, I'm going to take you down here to this inn. I'm going to buy you a room. I'm going to take care of you. I want you, and anything that you need, they're, they're going to, I'm going to tell them to take care of it. And when I come back, I will pay them for whatever so that you can be healed, so that you, your life can be what it needs to be. And so Jesus looks at these, at these who have accused him already and says, Hey, I, I love you. I, I love God. I love everything about God. I'm doing this. I love my neighbor's self. And he says, Now, do you really love your neighbor? They got a whole different perspective because they did not choose to see any other people as their neighbor except for the people who were like them. And so what can I do about my neighbors? How many of you know you have neighbors? Would you raise your hand? How many of you don't like your neighbors? Raise your hand. No, you don't have to do that. Who's my neighbor? Next thing is, what's my neighbor's greatest need? Jesus Christ. Right? We see that as a church. We say that as Christians. My, my neighbor's greatest need is they need to know Jesus. Now, how can I convey that? I am so busy. I've got so many things going on in my life. I, 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 don't, I don't go to my neighbor's houses. Matter of fact, most of the time we don't even know our neighbors. I mean, are you with me? Amen? He says, look, what, what, is that, what was that Samaritan's man? What was the Samaritan? What was the man on, on the road to Jericho? What was his greatest need? Somebody tell me. He was, he was broken. He had been robbed. He had been beaten. He was left for dead. What's his greatest need at that very second? He needs a physical healing. He needs somebody to help him. He needs somebody to lift him up. He can't get up himself. And so who are, who are we? Are we there to, to be that, that helper up, that one to, to lift them up? And so we find that greatest need. Then what can I do? How in the world can I do that? How can I reach into my neighbor's life and make a difference? I see the need. I understand I, I, personally, we live right here in the neighborhood, and I think about all my neighbors, I see them, I, and I think about things that they go through, and how can, I, how can I ever meet all their needs? How can I help them? How can I be a part of that? Well, I want to tell you, here's a good place to start. Where's the, where's the place I should start? If I'm going to try to reach somebody with the gospel of Christ, or I'm going to try to reach them and, and share Jesus with them, where's my first place i got to start? Somebody said it, I heard it, pray. you got to pray. You got to be right with the Lord yourself. Get that heart from God that I love God, and now because I love God, I want to apply myself and love my neighbor as myself. I'm going to give you a tool tonight that'll help you. Are y'all ready? It did not show it there. There it is. Okay. I thought I'd. It's called Pray for Every Home. Anybody ever heard of it besides my Sunday school class? People in our Sunday school class. Anybody ever heard of Pray for Every Home? Pray for Every Home is something that has changed my prayer life. Here's what it does, and it's real simple, and you, can y'all read that at the bottom where it says PrayForEveryHome.org? Y'all see that right here? Can y'all see that? All right, just make it sure. Pray for every, write that down. Real simple, it don't cost, it's, it's no money. That's what we like, right? It is, you, you log into it, you have your own little account, you put your address in. Here's what it does. Pray for every home lets you pray for 100 of your neighbors. Now, I want to ask you something. How many of you, right now, every single day, you pray for 100 people every day? Would you raise your hand? Sometimes we do. All right. But what about how can, I, how can I start in my own neighborhood praying for people? This, I, I don't have any more slides or whatever. You can go on the website and look at it. You'll see. Here's what it does. You put your address in. It gives you 100 people that are your neighbors to pray for. It does it five per day. 
So here's the whole deal with that. Here's what it does. It encourages you to pray. It'll do this. It'll send you tomorrow, if you sign up today, tomorrow it's going to send you five neighbors to pray for by name and address. You say, wow, that's a little person. Can I just let you know something? Anybody around the world can get your name and address. Okay? This is a, a database uh, right where you live. It's a, 100 people. It sends you five people per day. When it sends you that five people, here's, here's what it does. It gives you the opportunity in your email. You pray over those people. It gives you their names. You pray over them and click that you have prayed for them. Because if you do not click that you have prayed for them, it's going to keep sending you that email of those same people until you pray for them. So what does that do? That keeps you accountable. That every single day, I'm going to have five people. And then I want to I be real honest with you. Then you start getting excited. Who are these five people? I've, I have done this five times. I've prayed through my hundred people uh, at least five times. I think I'm starting on my sixth uh, time. And uh, just, uh, so I believe I started again uh, today on uh, maybe the seventh time that I've prayed through my five people. Every single day, pray for those five people. And then the next day, it sends you five more people. Until you get all the way around to a hundred people, it starts over. Can I just let you know something that begins to happen in your life? When you start praying for those five people every single day, which leads up to 100 over 20 days, here's what's going to happen. It is like unbelievable. You are going to start encountering some of those people. Something's going to happen to where you're going to meet those, some of those people. I've had it to happen over these last few times that I've prayed over these people. It's amazing that I've had people with prayer objects, have people with needs, I've seen people in the grocery store, I thought, man, I, hey, uh, by the way, it sure can help you out in remembering their names, amen, and you're praying for them, you pray for them, and then here's the door opener, when you see them, and you begin to get into conversation, you say, hey, I just want you to know I've been praying for you, I want to give you this a a in closing, one of my neighbors which uh, I, I really, uh, it, it happened in two different weeks. So they live on the same street. It's, you know, it just comes up and give, gives their name to pray for. One I, I was praying for, and I did not even realize what was going on. I was praying for that person. I prayed for them. It gives you a little opportunity to pray, to, to follow some different things, to pray about that person. I was praying for them. And, and they happened to, to, to be at a place where I was. And they said, oh, here is my need. And they began to tell me. And I thought, wow, that is just what I have prayed for for those people. God knows. Amen. Another place uh, that I, I was at, it's a place of business, and I happened to be talking to this man, and he said, hey, uh, man, I, I, I want you to pray for us. Pray for my family. We're, we're, we're doing this. We're, we're seeking the Lord's will. And I said, hey, I, I've been praying for you, man. I have been, and now I will. He was, he was on my neighbor list. What a connection. What if our neighborhoods would just start getting together and praying? Prayer changes things. Amen. How can that, it can happen? Let that be that start of an outreach. Let that be that place. God, how can I reach? I, I don't know that I'm going to go to every single door. God, I don't know how, how I'm going to, you may be afraid to go to every door or talk to them. And it, but what about praying for them? Amen? The greatest tool you and I have is to be able to go before the throne of God and to be able to pray and trust God right where we are. For, not only for our needs, but for somebody else. Be that intercessor. Be that one who prays and intercedes for that person. And so, when I think about outreach, it begins, first of all, right where we are. Pray for them. It begins in prayer. It begins in my heart, being where it needs to be with God. Then it begins in that place of praying for that person so their life can be where it needs to be. Pray that God will intervene in their life. In every turn, that they will see Jesus. That they will be surrounded by Jesus' people. They'll be surrounded by the gospel. That everywhere they go, somebody will be talking to them about Jesus. I don't know about y'all, but I want my whole neighborhood to get saved. Amen? What a tool. Very simple. Every single day, God gives you that opportunity. Somebody told me not long ago, said I, I, uh, they said, I don't even have 100 people that live around me. They live way out in the country. I said, I don't even think I got 100 people. I said, type your address in, you'll find out these people eyeballing you, amen? These people are everywhere. That person began to pray for people in their community. And that, uh, I don't know if it was that week or the week after, something happened in their life. And somebody they had not seen in 20 years 
Didn't realize they lived in the neighborhood. Brought them together. Wow, I've been praying for you. Can I let you know something? Prayer is powerful. And prayer changes lives. Because Jesus said, I want you to pray about everything. Amen? We can pray for our neighbors. Begin outreach in prayer. Let's pray together. Father, thank you, God, for who you are. Thank you for what you are doing in our lives. God, thank you for the opportunity you have given us, God, to be part of what you are doing right here in our lives, Lord. God, you want to use us in people's lives. You want to use us, God, in our friends, our family members, our neighbors, our neighborhood. God, you want to use us. Lord, you did not put us where we are by mistake. God, you know where we are, and God, you know everybody that's around us that needs you to speak in their life. They need your peace. They need your grace. God, they need you, God, to bring them that place of being saved, of being, having the peace with you. And Father, I just ask you right now, God, that you would touch every single person in this building, that we would totally love you with all of our heart, God, that we would love our neighbor as ourselves. that we would be obedient to you, God, and step forward in prayer, applying that opportunity that you have given us, God, to walk before the throne of grace so that you can walk into every home. God, would you open doors that we could never even imagine you could open. God, would you do miracles that we would never even think that would ever be possible. God, as you said in the book of, uh, of Ephesians, Lord, that you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or even think according to the power that worketh in us. Lord, thank you, God, that you have all power. Lord, right now, help us to do our part. Help us to step into what you want to do in our lives, God, and be obedient to you. God, in prayer, be obedient to you in outreach that people can come to know you as Savior and Lord. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for who you are, Lord. God, thank you for that opportunity you give us. Now, with heads bowed and eyes closed for just a second, you say tonight, Pastor, I'm really not sure tonight that I know Jesus. I'm not sure that there's a place in my life I've ever trusted the Lord. And if I died tonight, I'm really not sure that I go to heaven. Pray for me. Would you just slip your hand up? I'm really not sure I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm not sure I'm saved. Pray for me. You say tonight, you know something, Pastor, in my life, I know I'm saved, but I, I, I've walked away from the Lord. My, my heart is not where it needs to be with God. I'm kind of like that Levite. I know there's some things that need to be done, but I just haven't done them. And tonight, I, I need God to help me. I need to get things right with the Lord in my life. Pray for me. Would you just slip your hand up? Just, just be obedient to God. Thank you. God bless you. You say, tonight, Pastor, in my life, I have neighbors and friends that don't know Jesus. And I really have not been burden about their lives pray for me that I will step into where God would have me in reaching them whatever God would have me to do that I'd be obedient to him in sharing Jesus with them would you just slip your hand up I got people in my heart around my life and I, I just want to be obedient hallelujah Lord we give every hand that's been lifted tonight to you and we ask you God to lead us and guide us direct us God use us as a light in a dark world so people can come to know you as Savior and Lord we give you thanksgiving and praise for all your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen.